welcome everybody. Uh, I just want to welcome everybody back. Um, thanks for joining in tonight. Uh, it's good to see everybody, Aaron and, and Rex. It's great to see you. Um, I think we probably sh um, should get started tonight uh, because my goal is to get testing done. Uh, <laughs> I feel like we've been on this topic for several weeks now, and I for sure want to get this done. So um, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna waste any time jumping in there. But um, just as a quick reminder for uh, for anybody, like if if we want to, I know I say I want to get done with it, but again, like I just want to encourage anybody if you have questions or you want to have more conversation, you know, please please let me stop, you know. Uh, we can have a conversation. And, and even if we have pushed this to four weeks, that's great. Um, but I'm getting a little tested out. So um, <laughs> hopefully we can finish tonight. But again, I do encourage you, if, if you do have questions, please definitely ask. Um, for people that are watching this later, you'll notice that some of my content might be out of order with the book. It's obviously going through a restructuring. We've talked about that the past couple of times, but I think there's been some minor shifts in content, nothing too major that I've seen recently. So if somebody's watching this later, just understand that my content's probably going to be out of order with what the book is in the future because it's changing quite a bit. So, but let's continue our conversation. Uh, let's see, let me share my screen here real quick. Screen three, desktop. Let me bump up the text here real quick. Can everybody see that? All right, great. So we're going to kind of finish our conversation of testing tonight. And where we kind of left off is we were we were last discussing this idea of removing tension between interactive tests and automated testing. And we kind of finished up with this thought before we ended this idea that your, your tests are going to run in different environments. Your tests aren't just going to run on your computer. They're going to run um, on other people's computers. They're going to run if you submit it to CRAN. It's going to run on CRAN's machines. If you submit it to some service for automated testing, it's going to get tested. If you have some CI CD pipeline set up for your, um, for your version control, it may be tested in that as well. And so there was this discussion about just know that there are differences in where your tests are going to be run. And so to do what you can to facilitate your testing suite to run in many of those different environments. And so some of the tips that the book discussed about is first off, use those convenience tools that DevTools provides to you doing the load all, making sure that you exclude any library calls within your testing suite. Again, going back to using your description file to manage those um, dependencies. And then the last one, which is source, um, never use source in your test files, which I found was kind of interesting. I, I reread this and I was going through uh, a package to kind of kind of read through it, somebody else's package that's open source. And I was looking through it and I saw this and I saw somebody using source on top of their test files. And I was like, no, 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 that's, 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 uh, that's bad form. So um, I can't, I can't rep too bad on this person because this is a really, they have a really good package they put together. But I saw this and I was like, oh, well, uh, according to Hadley and um, Jenny Bryan, we're not supposed to do this. So, but again, the reason why, you know, the book suggests not doing these things is again, to keep that idea to, or to keep that idea that your tests are going to run in different environments and facilitate your ability to run it in different environments by following those kind of best practices. So where we where we were getting into is this idea of the files that were relevant to testing. And so um, it goes beyond just having test files. Uh, the book really kind of talks about when you get into that kind of macro level view of your entire testing suite, there's different like organizational structures or different architectures that you can follow to organize how your tests and the objects that you use within your tests can be put into your testing, into your test suite. And so what's really important about this section is first kind of identifying what those relevant files are for your testing suite, and then some of the best practices for interacting with the file system. Um, so again, one of the big things about the file system is, is that we want to make sure that uh, when somebody installs and attaches our package into their environment, it doesn't have any side effects onto the user's uh, file system, as well as um, making sure that uh, if we do have to make any changes because of our testing suite or if any of our developers have to do that, we clean up after ourselves. And so we'll talk about that a little bit uh, later on in this kind of section as well. So what are kind of the important uh, directories? Well, we've already kind of talked about these, so I'm not going to dig into this too much. 
but really again all of our tests are going to be in that test test that directory and then we're going to have all these separate or we're going to have the separate file called test test that and test that dot r which actually runs all of our tests for us when we do our um when we run our entire test suite so doing that uh shift command shift command t so um but the other thing that was kind of interesting about this was this idea of how we actually go about organizing additional utilities or helper functions that we might have within our testing suite. And so what's really interesting about this is that the book kind of talked about that if we are going to have to develop like helper functions that we potentially could use within our testing suite, we can dump those into our R directory so that they become available. Now, what was interesting about this idea is that if you do have helper functions that are available for your testing suite is, is you know, to append it with that test-helpers.r or the test-utils.r or utils-testing.r. And so it's just creating an organizational structure for you to kind of know that these functions that are embedded within that R directory of your package are used within your testing suite. And so um, again, it just it goes back to, it goes back to this idea that anything that's in that R directory, that when you do that load all, those functions become available. So they should become available when you're actually running your tests. And so it's just kind of a good way if you do need helper functions of some type to kind of put them into that R directory. There's also some discussion about setup files. I really didn't understand this and I was gonna open this up to the group to kind of maybe discuss it a little bit. But the way I understood the setup files was um, it's, it's, it's the ability that if you do need to make a change to the R landscape in some way, you have a setup file that builds up that environment for you and tears it back down. And so, and what's also important about this too is, is that with the setup file, when you run your dev tools load all, it doesn't load in or doesn't manipulate the environment for that setup. Now, I put a question mark here of use cases. I don't know if anybody here in the group had any insight on this. I, this part was just over my head because I, I, I've never, I've never used it and I've never seen it, but um I guess the one example that was provided in the book was this reproducible example for uh, from uh, uh, from the from the package reprex, and this was the example that it was discussing this file test test that setup that r. So I'm just going to open up to the group. Has anybody ever used this or have any idea why we would use this? No. <laughs> some of the stuff, some of the stuff I was like, hey, that's kind of neat, but I've never seen it used or like, I just don't like, I could see the use case for it, but I've just never used it. So, but if this is something that you're interested in, a good place to start to see where it is used is in the Reprex package. Um, and then you can kind of see the link right there. Real so then, oh, go sorry, ahead, Ryan. Colin, real quick, in, in the uh, application of the setup files, let me just give kind of a, a background of maybe where this could be drawn from. So following Colin Fay's uh, uh, packaging, engineering, production grade, shiny apps, there is a chapter dedicated to uh, setting up a MongoDB to work with Golem and kind of manage content outside of R but accessing it like a database concept, but it requires that you have Docker. It requires that you set up the Docker image for MongoDB, that you set up all of these different linkages between there and then start to build your application or package around that service. Could that be an example of maybe this setup file? If the topic or the thought is related to uh, either supportive functions, sorry, supportive environments that are outside of the R package that we're running. Uh, the next thing that comes to mind is a lot of these other services. And I can't, uh, Aaron, if you want to jump in and help me on the the uh, other half of uh, like the like biology, uh, human uh, cell type uh, media, medical uh, relation to R. Uh, there's packages that may also uh, utilize this same concept. I, I don't know that for a fact, but Spark is what comes to mind if you have mm -hmm. to set up a, a Spark instance and then your package interacts with that uh, for either these testing functions to make sure that it's able to connect uh, to Spark and run that application. Um, 
it would ex it, it would explain or express why tearing that system down after it's complete would be uh, a uh, vital component. You don't want to leave those uh, extra services running, uh, using resources and just bugging up somebody else's computer. Just a thought. Mm. That's what I was thinking is that, you know, it goes back to that concept because when you look at this tester or when you look at this setup file here, there's this with our option with local options, which I would guess that with the reprex package, it has these options that, you know, when you run your testing suite, it probably changes them to true. And so you're changing the R landscape. And then so when the testing suite is finished, it will, you know, clean up after itself. And that's what I'm guessing this teardown environment does. So I wonder if I go back to test that because I'm interested where teardown environment is. Well, maybe anything it, that it's generated, it removes from the file structure. That's what I would think it does. I mean, it's obviously encapsulated with inside of a function, but I, I'd have to dig around and find it. But that would be my guess anyways, is that it's, it's in tests. Test that. Oh, here, helper.r. So with mock, well, there's some, well, there's some mocking in there. So that's interesting. That's would be my guess. I mean, I don't want to waste people's time kind of digging because like, I don't have the exact example of it, but yeah, I think that's right. Like, you know, it's just like setting these local functions when you run the testing suite. And then once the testing suite is done running, then it tears it all down. It's just cleaning up after yourself. So, um, and the same thing, like if you were, if you needed some outside service, which we'll talk a little bit more about later, same thing. Like if you have to build up an outside service to R, instead of having that service up and running, you're going to break it down after you get done running your testing suite, right? Because you don't want to waste those resources. But I don't know. Does anybody else have any input on that? I, I, I think that's, I think Ryan, what you're saying is spot on. I just, I've just never used it. <laughs> Most of this advanced stuff, I was like, this is cool. And I could see some use cases, but I just, I've just never used them. Um, so then the next thing that it talks about is this idea of test data. And we're going to talk a little bit more about this in depth about like creating objects that we could potentially use within our testing suite. And so it really kind of talks about like, where do you store these extra objects that you're going to use within your tests? And so there are some different conventions that it proposes that you can do. And we'll dig into that a little bit more depth here. But one of the big ideas of it was this idea of using or using this directory called fixtures and fixtures would hold those objects. So whether that be like a .rds file or a data frame of some type um, or some other object that you want to use within your testing suite, use that fixtures directory to, to store it in there. And then I thought this was kind of interesting right here is this function called test path. And so um, I, I, I always kind of find the struggle in my mental model, like when somebody like installs a package and attaches it, is how that changes the directory structure when that happens. And so in my mindset, when I'm doing like, when I'm doing development of a package on my computer, it all works. But then the second that you install it and then install and attach it, the file system structure changes. And so sometimes I get a little struggle with that. But what's interesting about it is, is that there's this test path function that allows you to have robust file paths. So when that installation attachment of your package occurs or uh or excuse me when somebody excuse me when somebody uses your uses your packages in developing it this test path function will facilitate to give you those robust robust file paths so you're not worrying about you know absolute versus relative paths and you can kind of just use this function to kind of help facilitate that um and then the other thing about this is that files created during testing um you know it really discusses, it goes back to that concept of like, try to avoid changing the R landscape. And so I think, I think that's kind of the same. Like, I think that's like one of the undercurrents of this entire chapter is like, don't change the R landscape. Don't change the R landscape. Don't change it. And if you want to change it, maybe think about not changing it. And, but if you do have to change it, make sure you clean up after yourself. So like, I, I think that point has been like clearly drilled into us of this idea of like, if you're changing the R landscape, don't do it. But if you have to, you know, um, you should only write files in that temp directory. Uh, so I'm not really familiar with, I, I understand it is kind of like a recycling bin that gets cleaned up after the processes run. And, and Ryan, you might be able to kind of dig into this a little bit more 
because you understand like operating systems better than I do. But if you do have to create some type of file system for your tests or to change it, use that temp directory. But again, it goes back to that same concept. You know, if you do this, clean up after yourself. So um, it's just nice to clean up after yourself. So tidy it up. Uh, let's see. So the, the next thing, this is getting into chapter 15. Now these ideas uh, are these ideas surrounding advanced testing techniques. And so um, with this, we, it really kind of digs down into what are, are the different kind of methods you can use for test fixtures. And so kind of the concept that this section of the, of this, of the book is talking about is when it's not practical to make your tests entirely self-sufficient, use a test fixture. So one of the, one of the kind of things that we talked about with those high level principles of testing was this idea that our tests should be self-sufficient. So they should be encapsulated. So everything that we need should be encapsulated within our test. And that's not always possible. And so uh, sometimes what we need is we need external data to run our tests, or we need some type of object that we generate that, that is transcended across all of our tests or used for all of our tests. And so there's different methods that we can use to facilitate this, um, to facilitate the use of these objects through test fixtures. And so the book provides this definition from Wikipedia. I just shamelessly took this from the book, but a test fixture is something used to consistently test some item, device, or piece of software. So I kind of think of it as like a data frame that gets pushed to all of your tests that you're gonna use. And so um, we're gonna talk about different ways to use this kind of test fixture. The first one is loaded in as a static object. That's one of the methods of doing this. Um, the other one is kind of write a constructor function. So say we need to build or create some type of object that we're gonna use within our tests. We can create a constructor function to create it within our tests and then abstract the logic of creating that outside of our tests. And then we can implement a test fixture so we can build it up, break it back down if we need to. So the first kind of, the first, kind of method that it talks about is this idea of creating a useful help for helper function. So what the book suggests doing in this case right here is if you have um, type some type of object that you want to create that's going to be used in multiple different tests, this idea is, well, take that creation of that object and abstract it out through the use of a function. And so this example just comes directly from the book, but it's just basically it's creating this function here called new useful thing, which is the object that you're going to use within your tests. And anytime that you want to use this object, you just call the function within your test. So here, this test is going to re require the object that gets outputted by new useful thing. And so you just run it, you run the function in the test and, and, and give it, you know, some type of value. And then this value is used within your expectation functions. So then again, if you have another test that needs to use this same object, rather than it being persistent within your environment, what you're going to do is, is then you just call this same function inside of here. And so um, I thought this was kind of an interesting idea. Um, but again, it just kind of abstracts your knowledge or just kind of abstracts your creation of this object. And anytime that you need to use it, rather than having it being persistent, you just call the function. Um, where do you put this function? Well, a good place to put this would be your R directory, right? Most of our functions that we develop in our package, they go into the R directory. And so uh, this is best. This is also good if you want to use this function again somewhere else within your package. So um, it's, it's just a good option that you can use it in multiple different places. If you don't want to make it available um, as a function within your package, you can place it within, you know, tests and test that directory and then... Um, uh, give it a useful name, and then use that function within your tests. I think this one is pretty straightforward, but uh, what questions do people have about this idea of like creating a helper function for your tests? All right, cool. So then this, this next idea was this idea of creating a local useful function. So, um, uh, has a side effect. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So this was kind of going back with the idea of like, if you have to, 
um, if you need to create some type of function or if you need to create some type of object that a lot of different tests are going to use, and rather than calling that function every time within your tests, what you're going to do is you're just going to create this useful thing for when your test suite builds runs all of your tests and then afterwards it's going to clean up after itself and so basically what it's doing is it's just creating this local useful thing one time for your entire testing suite and then it's going to after it gets done it's going to clean up everything that you need after you use it um, it's again kind of the same kind of concept but it's that idea of just like building it up and then breaking it back down the next kind of method that was out there was this idea of just storing a concrete useful thing persistently. And so I think this is what a lot of people will probably opt to do. But say you have like some data frame that you want to use within your test, save it as a .rds file. Save it as a .rds file and put it in your fixtures directory in your test that function. And then inside of your test, just run read rds using that test path um, convenience function for your to, to maintain that kind of robust file path directory. And then here you go, you can use it within your test right here. So again, the difference of this is that you have that object that's stored persistently within fixtures. And so it's available for you to call anytime that you need. Um, but again, different trade-offs for that. If you have something that's extensively large, like if you have a very large .rds file, this may not be beneficial. And again, going back to that kind of uh, going back to that kind of uh, kind of that best practice of not having you know very large files within our packages, so you got to take into consideration that this file can't be too large. So, um, but again, this is another option for you. And what you might do is is that you just store this within your fixtures directory under the test that directory, and then here are your different RDS files. So here's your useful thing one RDS inside of your test file, just run read RDS, and then it will be available for your expectation functions. Uh, I thought this was another interesting thing. Um, so the book really kind of talks about that if you are gonna do something like this, that you probably should also store your file to create your RDS file. Because one thing that you'll find out is that code doesn't always just run once. And so if you're creating some data object that you're gonna use within your tests, keep your code that is used to write that object. And so you can store that kind of that file that builds these RDS files in the fixture section as well. And that's just another best practice for you to kind of follow. So uh, I guess what questions do people have about this idea of storing, um, storing like concrete and useful things persistently? Has anybody ever done, has anybody, has anybody ever used the fixtures within their testing suite. This was something that was like brand new to me. Like I never really thought about this because when I, when I first started doing it, like when I started thinking about like storing things persistently, it was always kind of like just put it in like data raw or having it available in data was what I always thought to do. But then now this kind of changed my perception of that because now it should just be like, if you're going to use it just for tests, then it should be stored in fixtures. But this was something new. So uh, let's see. So then the book kind of starts talking about this idea of building your own testing tools. Um, so let's talk a little bit about repetition in your code. Uh, so the the book kind of first talks about, you know, when you're developing tests there's kind of this contention between the DRI, DRY principle, the do not repeat yourself. So this idea that if you copy more than copy things more than twice, you probably should abstract it out in some type of function and reuse it. However, in this kind of context of creating tests, um, the book kind of says, maybe you should bend a little bit on repetition. And so the book really kind of goes into this idea of, well, how can we handle repetition? Um, how can we handle this repetition within our code, uh, within our testing suite. And so, you know, here's kind of an idea of, here's kind of a hypothetical idea that, again, this example was just taken from the book, but this idea of um, that, here's the kind of testing suite with it. And it's running this like uh, object, the string is moderately long, um, you know, and running it in the side of this function, string trunk, 
and then it's doing the expectation of that expect expect equal. But again, this is the same thing over and over again. It's like, this is moderately long, the string is moderately long. And so this is repetition. And so that's going against the DRY principle. And so the book says, okay, well, maybe what we can do is we can abstract out some of this, ab some of this repetition into some type of function. But then the question is, okay, well, where do we store that function? Well, then the book discusses, well, what you can do is you can write some type of hyper-local function with inside of your testing suite to which then gets called in all of your functions here. Now, there is a trade-off with this because again, anytime that you write some type of function, and especially if you're defining some type of function outside of your like R directory, you're gonna potentially introduce bugs. And so if there's something wrong with this function or this function is super long and you can't figure out what's going wrong with it, you might be looking for your function in your R directory and be like, where's this function? But it's actually inside of your testing suite in this hyperlocal area. So this is a very simplified example, but if this was a more complex function, there could be more opportunities for you to introduce bugs, making it more confusing to you if your testing fails. Um, one of the benefits for this as well is again, you're kind of, you're, you're, um, uh, you're meeting the DRY principle, but the other thing that's nice about this too, is, is that anytime that you can line up your, um, expectation functions like this, it gives you the opportunity to better identify any, um, things that might not be as expected. So you can kind of see like, if there is any issues within this, it's easier to identify in this than it is in kind of this kind of spaghetti code. But since we're kind of in that advanced topic, there's trade-offs for your decision and what you do. There's good things to do. There's bad things. There, there's good things. There's bad. There's pros and cons. There's pros to doing this. There's cons to doing it. It's just you have to make that design decision. So uh, the book then kind of talks about if you have or if you're in a situation where you need to create custom expectations. Um, I would probably, I shouldn't say probably. I think the likelihood is very low that you could potentially need to create a custom expectation. That's probably a hot take. So if somebody's out there, be like, Colin, there's all these different use cases of creating your expectations. I'm sorry, tweet at me, correct me. But you have over 40 expectation functions in the test that package. So I'm just sitting there, I'm like, if you get in this situation, I, I don't know, it's, it's available to you. It's basically where I'm getting at with it, but do you need it? I don't know. But anyways, it's available to you, but the book kind of talks about this as well as like, if you're in a situation where you need to create your own expectation functions, that could be, a that might be a sign to you that you're, that there's something wrong with your function. And if you are writing this function that is that can't be covered by some expectation or some behavior within your function can't be addressed by the expectations that you have, do you need to refactor it is the question that's out there. And so, um, you know, maybe consider that you need to refactor your function or maybe your function isn't as clear as you think it should be. Maybe that's a good tip for you. But you know, there are uh, situations where you may need to create some custom expectation functions. And so the book kind of gives you some examples of how to do this. Again, you just wrap it into some type of function and then, you know, you use different expectations to meet that. And so some examples that were out there was this idea of if you're looking for a specific error, you might wrap this expect error function and then look for that specific error message that gets called. The other one was this idea if you're expecting some type of project file, you might use expect true, create file exists, project path, and does that path exist? And so I maybe I maybe I'd step back on my previous statement and say maybe there are situations for it, but um, I don't know. There's 40 different expectation functions from expect that. So it, it, the likelihood that you need to create your own might be limited, but hey, it's available to you. Um, what questions do people have about this concept of um, dealing with repetition and this idea of building custom expectations? Has anybody ever built their own custom expectation? <laughs> 
this is like super advanced. Like this is like, if you could do this, you're, 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 you're probably working for our studio and, and the Tidyverse dev team, because this is like super advanced stuff. I guess if you're, if, if you're pushing the limits of what the environment can do for you or what the packages can do for you saying like, you know, you've got some obscure thing that nothing really fits, but you've got to be able to test it anyway. I guess you could build your own custom custom uh, test function for it. Um, I don't know. I'm, I'm in the back of my mind. I'm thinking like uh, the the MacBook changed from its previous architecture into this M1 uh, style of, of processor. And all of a sudden it, it created this huge new playing field of weird that everyone's been dealing with. And so maybe the the package you're developing and now it's moving into this new architecture and now all the functions that I was testing with don't work quite right in the environment that I'm testing them on. I don't know if that is even fitting the bill for a custom expectation, but for me, I'm getting this sense of you're in uncharted territory. Nobody else has done this before, but then anytime I ever get to that point in any development, I always have to stop and think, am I just approaching this problem? Like, am I boiling the ocean and creating my entire environment completely new when I could just, you know, fit into a mold that somebody else has already built. Uh, I have to always uh, ponder that statement uh, anytime I'm pushing the envelope on any of this, the technology that we're familiar with. Yeah. It, I, when you were talking there a little bit, Ryan, I was kind of thinking about it going back to a conversation that I had with a conversation that I had on the Slack or the, the, the Slack group a while back with like Tan and, and John um, this idea of like when you, I was creating a package for like a specific report that we were generating. And so one of that might be like, you might create your own expectations for like a specific file needs to be available within your project. So this goes outside of like building your package. It's like you set up the, the, like the, the, the project framework for something that you're creating. And so there might be a requirement that you need some JSON file that contains like some secrets on it to access some outside service. And if you don't have that, it should clearly fail because your expectation is in your project folder that you have that file available and so you use it. That goes outside of testing, but that was like, as you were talking, I kind of remembered that conversation a little bit about like, hey, you need to have this file. So that's an expectation that I have. That file well, should be there, should run it. There's a, there's a service that I train on and it's related to electronic circuit board repair, soldering and, and service mount through hole, et cetera, et cetera. And there's a, there's a, there's a standard in this course that I, that I conduct that says, you know, you you may run into these really oddball, weird engineering, never been seen before, never been done before, but it works for the, for the, uh, uh, application that it's designed to, to, to work with. And so in that case, what you have to do is work with the customer. So if you're the vendor, you're the developer, you have to work with your customer. Here's our testing function. There must be an agreement between both parties that anything that I'm going to test or anything that you want to see additionally in this test, please let me know and I'll, I'll be able to, to build it. Uh, but otherwise, are you accepting this design that I'm creating? Um, is this appropriate? It does not follow any standard of electronics anywhere in the world. I'm creating it right now today to fit this per, you know, particular purpose. So being able to, to draw that same thought process back into this our packaging concept of you're pushing the envelope on areas that nobody's done before. Um, if you find yourself in that area, is there another application that would work that would still fit the need? Or are you literally building something from scratch that nobody has, nobody else has ever seen before? Um, you always have to pause and, and ask that question before go ahead and just say, you know what, I'm going to do it anyway, because I want to do it. Well, you might box yourself in a corner that, that, you know, your whole package comes crumbling down around you. Nobody's going to use it because nobody can understand it. Um, what's the, uh, what's that cartoon of the, uh, the, uh, useless engine, the, the mouse trap that, you know, the, the, like the marble has to pass through everything. Right. Um, I don't remember what that cartoon's name is. There's a, there's a term for that. Um, the Rube Goldberg machine, right? Yeah, there we go. Right, right, right. Is, is, is that kind of what this custom expectations thing is, right? Do you have to create that environment for yourself? Uh, it's a little bit, you're, you're, you're putting yourself out there. Um, 
maybe not being crazy, but uh, maybe not nobody else could follow you concept. I don't know. Just a thought. Yeah. I mean, it gets back to that point of like, you know, how rigid is your testing suite, right? Like you want people to contribute to it, but like if they're constantly getting failing tests for some weird edge case and you're not addressing it, you know, it gets back to that concept of like, yeah, I'm not going to like jump through hoops to contribute to this package because you have all of these like custom X and I'm, I'm just bashing on custom expectations, but it goes back to the entire testing suite of like, you know, if, if you're like breaking everything with just these little minor changes, nobody's going to contribute to it. Nobody wants to develop it and nobody wants to touch it. And so, um, but yeah, that's interesting. I like the Rube Goldberg thing. Yeah. That's a good one. You, you have to like meet all these little conditions to make it all work. And then it's just super fragile. Yeah. Cool. Uh, okay. So the next kind of concept that was discussing this idea of what happens when testing gets hard. And so there's certain situations where our testing suite may not be able to be run. And so there might be certain things that we need to do, or what can we do in those certain situations? And so there's several options to this. Um, the first and probably most common one is this idea of skipping a test in certain situations. Uh, the other, this other one is mocking an external service. And then the last one is kind of this little discussion about options for dealing with secrets. And so we'll talk about each one of these. We won't dive too much in mocking. Um, I can discuss a little bit about what it is, but the book really doesn't dive too much into it outside of saying like, this is what it is. Um, if you have to do this, think about maybe not doing this, but there's possibility to do it. So um, this first idea, and this is probably the most common one, is skipping skipping a test. And so um, this is the idea that if your environment is in a certain situation when you're running tests that don't meet the requirements for your tests, you probably should skip it. And so um, you can what you can do in this situation is you can write your own skipper functions. And so basically it's this idea that you're creating this function that if your environment doesn't meet the criteria for the specific tests in your testing suite to run, then it skips that test. It says, hey, just don't run this. Uh, no, I do not want to update Docker. So snooze. Um, so here's kind of a good example of this, like skip if no API. So people that aren't familiar with APIs, these are application programming interfaces. These might be... Um, gateways to out to services that you might use outside of your R environment. So a good example of this might be like a, a relational database management system. So say you're trying to connect to some database that's out there and that database gives you an API to interact with it. Now, what may happen is, is that service may be down. And if that service is down, you don't want your tests to give you the information of fail, fail, fail because that's not true. Your tests may be passing. It just may be that the service is not available for you to run your tests. And so again, it goes back to that idea of that ODA cycle of getting that like information back to you to know that your tests are you know, valid. Because if your tests are saying that they're failing when it's actually, no, they're failing because of the service, you need to kind of have some skips in there to say like, okay, if this specific criteria is not met for my tests, it needs to skip rather than fail. And so there's possibilities of doing that. That's just one example of, of an API. Another example might be, you know, skip when it's on CRAN. So um, if you have specific tests that you're only going to do local, or you have specific tests that are only going to run when you um, push to your version control system in your CI CD pipeline and they're not gonna run when they get submitted to CRAN. So a good example of this would be tests that just take too long or take too many resources to run. Um, what you might do is you might offload that kind of testing, that part of your testing framework onto your CI CD pipeline or for your developers to run an interactive testing. And so when you do submit your package to CRAN and they run your testing suite, they'll run this function skip on CRAN and it will just skip that test. It won't, it will just skip it. Uh, some other examples of where this might be used is, you know, we always don't have internet connection. So if you don't have internet connection, you can run this function called skip off, skip if offline. Uh, again, these are convenience functions that are available within test that. Um, if there's a specific operating system that you want to skip if it's being tested on. So 
If your tests are being run on a, a Windows-based system, you can skip that. Uh, I haven't dug too much in this. I would, I would assume this is probably available for the major operating systems, so Mac OS and Linux, other ones I'm not familiar with, but um, you can skip if somebody's running it on a Windows computer, but your tests are supposed to be running on Mac. So that's available to you too. Um, other thing is that in your output that you get from your testing suite, so again, when you run your tests, it will clearly signify for you that these tests have been skipped. So it will give you pass, skip, or fail information for your test. So if you if a test does get skipped, that information will be passed on to you. Uh, a good example of this, um, I'm not sure how familiar people are with like um, digital and website analytics, but um, Google Analytics, Google Analytics R is a package that I use quite significantly. Pretty much I probably use it every day, um, but I do a lot of um, website measurement. But this is an example of where you might use a testing framework that has skips in it. And so I'm just gonna pop up a test in here. Let's just do this function here, GA4 function. You can see that there's these, the, there's these skip functions. So skip on CRAN. So when this package gets submitted to CRAN, it will get skipped. Um, I also found this kind of interesting. I think the CI CD pipeline that this package uses is Travis, Travis CI. I'm not totally familiar with it, but it skips um, when, in, when these tests get run on the CI CD pipeline, these specific tests here. Now, why is this the case? Um, Google Analytics is an outside service. Um, it connects to that service using an API. And so when it gets submitted to CRAN, CRAN can't authenticate with that API. And so it has to skip. And so for this testing suite to run on CRAN, it has to skip those tests or it won't pass the CRAN check. And so um, I thought this was kind of interesting because this was just a good example of like where this might be used because this package does heavily rely on an outside service. So uh, let's see. Uh, oh, the other thing is, is when you when you do skip your test, make sure you're getting enough information that your skip your tests are being skipped. So again, getting back to like that you're getting information back and it's informative for you. So what questions do people have about skipping a test? This one's probably gonna be the most common thing. Uh, well, from what I understand, this is probably one of the most common like things that you'll kind of run across um, if you run into a situation that you can't have your test run. Um, the book kind of talks a little bit about mocking. Um, so the book kind of defines it like this. It's replacing something complicated or unreliable or out of your control with something similar that's fully within our control. So um, situations that you might use mocking is you wrap around, like say you have some API, some external service that you make a request into and it returns some data object back to you. Um, if that API is not really that reliable, uh, so it's always down or it may not be up in service. What you might do is you might just simulate what that object would be. So what that object gets returned from that API and just use that object within your test. A good exa another example of this would be a function that reports something about session state. So if I, I'm, I'm thinking of uh, within like a Shiny application, so if you're developing some type of Shiny app, if you have some type of session state that the environment that the Shiny app is going to be running, you need to have that, you could mock that state. Um, Ryan, I'm trying to remember, what's the what's that like browser extension? Like you can run a headless browser or something? Like you I, can I, like- I remember ahead. what you're- yeah, I remember what you're talking about. I, I think it's almost a like a daemon. It, it it doesn't it doesn't require the entire browser framework uh, or the the DOM engine, right? Chromium or or whatever whatever operating or sorry whatever browser you're using, but you just need a web socket, something to to bump it against, right? So it kind of it, it it emulates or or replicates these calls coming from you know a web service to the server, so that you're able to to emulate these calls of pushing the button or clicking the button uh, uh, 
what's the what's one of the arguments like you know you're filling in some uh, data point and as soon as it gets to that box it it dumps in you know whatever data predefined that you're wanting to test with um, is that kind of the thing that you're referring to yeah it, I don't remember I'm... the service name though yeah well the, the, the as you were talking it's this is so for people that are the people that are unfamiliar with shiny again it's just that kind of like web application it's built on top of R and basically what you can do is you can simulate like you can encode simulate how a user interacts with your shiny app record that interaction and then just pump that into your shiny app as you test what wasn't one of them like bazooka or it was some way that you could like like completely blast like multi-thread into a into a web application like almost test to make sure that it's able to handle that amount of users the uh uh, what, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I what remember what you're talking about. What session yeah. were we talking about? Because it was it was almost like a uh, a load test, right? You mm -hmm. want to see how many how many uh, calls you can make to the service before it starts to actually like crash the server. And I'm I'm, I'm thinking in my mind, I'm like, hey, these are not really good services. Hackers could probably use these to <laughs> take down, you know, whatever web servers you're dealing with. Anyway, but yeah, the, their their intent behind this mocking concept is uh, I'm not going to sit at my a screen and sit there and click the mouse through so many different points, I could create a service, this, this WebSocket interface, that as soon as the, the page paints, I automatically send that call, you know, to, to, to uh, uh, get to the next sequence of events, whatever that may be, refreshing the browser or something to that effect. Yeah. So it's just, it's just like, it, it kind of goes outside the concept of package development well, but a shiny can be wrapped up into a, a package. Like you could, you could mock the state of 10,000 users using your Shiny app. And that could be a test that you have because you have certain expectations that your Shiny app would run, you know, at some type of performance level with 10,000 users. So, um, and then the other idea is like testing it, it, whether like the session is interactive. So are you in an interactive session or are you not? Um, this actually kind of reminded me of an example when I just said this out loud was if you going back to this Google Analytics R package, what you can do is you can use these functions in an automated kind of sense. So like you can run automated reports if you wanted to, but if you're going to run automated reports, what you have to do is you can't be in an interactive session. And I mean, we can dig into it if people really want to know, but it's this idea that this is attached to a specific Google project. So there's like a Google project that's attached to this package for like testing and stuff. But when people just use that, like that development project, it eats up resources. And so it's like, hey, let's not do that. So it says like, if you're going to run automated testing, you need to have your own project. And so the expectation fails if it's saying that you're not in an interactive session. Um, that might be more than people need to know, but it just kind of reminded me that, that that was kind of a situation that it tests for this, um, if the session is interactive or not. Uh, we talked about kind of the responses, uh, but it really kind of comes down to this, even though this is kind of a cool and interesting thing, the book suggests uh, avoid mocking if possible, because it's just, if this service or thing is already unreliable and it's flaky in its, in it, in its kind of nature, it, your testing is going to be really hard. It's going to be a moving target. So your return on investment, there might be no like real return on investment for doing this, but again, you know, it's context specific. If you need it, it's available for you. There's tools to do it. I was going to add one comment to that. If you don't mind, uh, Go for it. Uh, Colin with, with the thought of setting up these environments, virtual machines, VMs, even Docker, uh, containerization sometimes does not provide you the same level of application of a bare bones server. Uh, so just be cautious of that. If you are running a VM, um, be, be aware that that VM may be reliant on the same uh, host operating system that the virtual machine is tied to. Um, if you're running a Docker engine or, or Docker container, um, again, it's still reliant on the resources that the operating system that you're testing is running on as well. So just keep in mind that sometimes bare bones is the best way of really, um, I guess I'm, I'm in this mindset of load balancing or just load testing. Um, VMs and, and that application don't always provide you the same services of a, uh, of a bare bones operating system environment. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I think that's kind of an important thing of just like return on investment. Yeah, just because you you can do it, does it is it really valuable? Is it really what you need in your testing suite? Depends on the service that you're creating, right? It depends on the package that you're creating. So, um, but just again, it's context specific. Uh, the last kind of thing, and this is the last kind of topic we'll talk about is just some special considerations for CRAN packages. Um, if you are going to submit to CRAN, there are some tools that are available for you to help check your package, um, on specific environments. So, uh, kind of the, the most recent thing is utilizing GitHub actions to perform tests in different environments. So if you, I think Jim Hester had a really good Jim Hester, I, I may, I'll link this in the, I'll link this in the Slack group, but I think Jim Hester had a really good discussion about how the Tidyverse uses GitHub Actions to make sure that all of their packages run with, I think, well, with the three most important operating systems, up to like five past versions of R or something like that, and so they, the Tidyverse kind of, well, Jim Hester doesn't work for the Tidy or doesn't work for our student anymore. He works at Netflix now, but he had a kind of a discussion about how to use GitHub Actions to, you know, test within different environments. I'll, I'll see if I can find that talk because I thought that was kind of interesting, way beyond, way beyond my understanding, but it was pretty cool to watch. Um, another thing that I kind of learned was these, uh, like, uh, these other kind of build services that are available that you can submit your package to, and it will test it into an environment. And I didn't know these existed, so I thought these were kind of cool. But um, our hub is available. Uh, this is a service that you can submit your package to, and it will run your specific testing suite on um, specific environments. Um, there's also, um, you know, Windows Builder, which is for Windows and Mac OS Builder. If you need those services, those are available to you. Um, has anybody ever used any of those, like R Hub or Win Builder or Mac OS, OS Builder? Well, if you need it, they're available to you. Um, so when it comes to when it comes to your CRAN submission, and again, I can't really speak to um, submitting to CRAN. Um, I know we have a few people here who've had that experience, um, and it, maybe people could speak to that. But usually, when you get uh, like a when you go against the CRAN repository policy, it's usually your testing suite that's the culprit. So um, the thing to remember is that when your tests are getting run, they're going to get run. And somebody correct me if I'm wrong. They're going to get run when you submit to it. And then it's going to be continually run as the package is archived on CRAN. And if your testing suite fails, um, it's either going to send you a message that you have to fix those tests or it's going to remove it from CRAN if you don't fix those tests or fix your, fix your package to meet your testing framework. Um, I don't know. Can anybody speak to that? That's what I kind of understood with that. But... I don't know if anybody has any experience with this, but um, the book kind of talks about like, that's like, thanks Rex. Uh, shiny driver, that's it. Yep, 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 shiny driver. Um, but yeah, so again, when it comes to like failing on CRAN, it's just, it's usually, you know, test your test suite is kind of the culprit of where it's failing. And so, it's important to take into consideration that if you do have some like flaky tests that are going to fail, consider adding skip on CRAN. Uh, also, when you submit, make sure that you consider the speed of your tests. So again, um, remember that CRAN machines are heavily loaded. Um, you got to make sure that you can't have tests that run a very long time that take up a lot of resources. So the book said suggests that any test testing suite or any part of your testing suite that gets run on CRAN that part should run less than a minute. The other thing is, is keep an eye on reproducibility. You know, again, that idea that CRAN machines are heavily loaded. Also, you gotta realize that CRAN machines can't always be used to run tests running parallel code. So if you have tests that are running parallel code, just understand that there might not be resources available to do that. And then also be aware that numerical precision can also vary across platforms. So if you have a very rigid test that um, has an expectation that has a very <clears throat> narrow numerical precision. Just understand that there's differences across operating systems and differences across environments. 
And so whatever cram machine is running your tests, there may be differences in that numerical precision. One of the other things is avoid those flaky tests. Um, there, what, once your package is sitting on CRAN, there's no human judgment. It's a machine running it. So just understand that, you know, people aren't seeing your failed tests. If a test fails, nobody's going in there and saying, why is this failing? Can I make sure it's still running? It's not happening that way. Machines are checking it. And so um, there's really, when you write your tests that are going to be running on CRAN, make sure that there's no room for human, ju human judgment in those cases. Now, that doesn't mean that in your testing suite, you don't have tests that have some human judgment in it. Just know that when you submit to CRAN, maybe if there is some human judgment within your test, just skip it. Um, this also includes tests for external services, which we talked about, and snapshot tests. If you're submitting CRAN, you probably shouldn't be doing snapshot tests. Um, then the other thing was like CRAN requires your packages not to write to the file system. Oh, shoot, this got messed up because secrets was supposed to be a part of. Oh, shoot. Sorry, guys. This got messed up. This was supposed to be somewhere else. Um, I'll talk about this last point and we can talk about secrets really quick. But CRAN requires your package to write, uh, should not write to the file system. So just don't write it to the file system. And if you do have to, when you submit to CRAN, skip it. Um, I guess we can talk about secrets a little bit, but uh, the. <laughs> The end part of this is if your test requires some type of secret, some type of authentication with it, um, what you should do is you should probably design your package not to do that. Um, but if you need to do that, there's more discussion of that in the hitter two documents. Um, I've struggled with this portion a little bit. I've had a little conversation on the Slack group about it before. So if anybody wants to dig into like, where do you store your treatment or where do you store your secrets for authenticating, authenticating services within your package, be more than happy to have that conversation. So that is a three weeks deep, deep dive into testing. <laughs> I appreciate everybody hanging on for those three weeks because that, I learned a lot, but it's a lot. <laughs> but um, so I'm gonna open it up uh, I know I'm at nine o'clock. So if anybody has to jump off, um, you know, more than welcome to, but um, I'm going to open it up. Does anybody have any questions, comments, um, further discussion of what we've kind of discussed through these past few sessions? Do you reckon there's any, um, I don't know what the difference is between the like Windows Builder, Mac OS Builder and um having like the github actions to check a package on like through github i don't know if that like sets up a container or what but it does those you know i think i think that's actually a few chapters of the head right where it tested on different uh, os's but i don't know the difference between using the builder services versus the github action that's a good question does anybody want to, does anybody have any input on that one? I don't know this for a fact, but I think a lot of those builder or the GitHub actions relies a lot of containerization. And I think you can specify what container you're building on. Maybe that's where those come from. I don't think I'm answering your question, but um, in my very lack of experience with CI, CD and or uh, some of these Travis CI GitHub Actions uh, process. Um, I, I think that's one of the things that you can you can specify during the creation or during the during the submit and then process automated processing on the back end before it spits out whatever it is that that it's compiled. Um, I could be completely speaking offhand though. I I I, I haven't dealt with it directly. No. Right. So, it, so is our hub, is that like a containerized thing, like just the same, or is that totally different? Uh, the way it looks right in their about page, it looks like it's just a builder that offers a free R command check as a service on different platforms. So my guess is it would be, it's just, it's installing and attach, well, it's installing your package and then running the R command check on Windows, Linux, 
you know, Mac right. OS. So it might be equivalent. Yeah, well, I know. Okay, so the one thing that I would probably say is like with Jim Hester's talk, like he really dives into like GitHub Actions and how the Tidyverse like software development team uses it. What I understood about that is if you use GitHub Actions is you can hyper customize that, right? You set up the YAML file for you to build up your container and your environments and how you want to run your tests, right? Like there are some convenience functions within use this that kind of like sets it up for you. But if you want to get like super hyper customized and run on different versions and set up different containers and do that, this talk like does a pretty good job, like broad overview, broad strokes of it. But um, outside of like our hub and all these, like this reading, this was the first time I was ever introduced to this, to be honest. I didn't know that these services were even available, um, but I don't know. Did that answer your question, Rex? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I just sent the link to the like GitHub action thing for check standard and it pretty much does the same thing from what I understand, like just running R run check on the three OSs. I'm just curious because like waiting for R hub is a bit annoying whereas like the github actions faster and maybe less cumbersome to do because it's automatic um and like when you're releasing to cram is it also necessary that you really do the like are you ever going to find a difference between the github action result using this like github action check standard versus the arc of builder i don't know mystery <laughs> Oh, that I yeah, that's a good question. Well, I guess it would depend on what environment that our hub is, you know, running your R command check in. I'm sure there's probably a way to like mirror that, but that's that's an excellent question. I'm not I'm not sure. The way I understand with like again, it goes back to with like with the GitHub Actions is like you can get hyper customized with it. Like you can you can build up and break down whatever environments you want to run it in um it seems like our hub like this our hub and then like the mac os builder and everything else was like this is a free service we'll run it for you you know use it for your own benefit but um i think it's a great service like if you don't want to go through the process of like setting up your own environments and setting up your own github actions but i don't know i i really highly suggest this one from jim haster because it really kind of you know, it really kind of does that good discussion about like how the tidyverse team like addresses this because it was really cool. It like really dives down deep into like all the stuff that they're testing to make sure that all the tidyverse packages, you know, run on multiple environments, run on multiple R versions. And it was, it's, it's beyond, beyond what I know, <laughs> but it's cool. It's really cool. <laughs> Ryan, were you gonna say something? I didn't mean well, to catch you I, off I, there. No, I just no, it's okay. I, I I I've got this thought in the back of my mind. A lot of these automated tools, a lot of these builder and test type applications that are, are really intended to automate your life, right? Make things a little bit simpler for you. So you're not, you know, doing the math in your brain as you're trying to figure out if the computer is coming up the same way or not. Um, the the important thought or the 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 reason these more automated tools come to mind or, or something that I, I continually try to push to other staff members is, you know, let the computer do what the computer does special, right? Uh, don't try to do it yourself. That's not really the best way of approaching the problem. You could go this other route and, you know, save yourself hours and hours and hours of pain and, and heartache uh, by, by just writing a, a few lines of code, submitting it like Rex is mentioning to the, to the GitHub actions or these builder tools and just let the tool do its job and then spit out some report that makes it a little bit easier to figure out if it passed or not. Um, I, I do like Rex's comment about if, if you push to these builders and you don't get any errors, would it imply that CRAN is going to give you the same errors? I would think not if, if the tool itself is, is doing it. But um, what, one of the things that I have in the back of my mind is just resource constraints. Um, a lot of the times when you are, are requesting these services and you're building these environments, they may take up quite a bit of room on a server. And so if, if it is a 
free and open source application. There's not a lot of funding and not a lot of uh, horsepower that's behind that server. Um, there are limitations. So that could be a factor that you may want to think about. Um, I'm not saying that money always pays for things. If it's open source, it should not have to have some monetary value associated uh, unless you're contributing and that's a personal choice. But um, if you're paying for a service, right? So uh, if you're doing it for a business, a company, and you say, hey, you know, they, they want $1,000 a month for me to use this application, uh, but I'm guaranteed to have, you know, 200 terabytes of storage and, you know, this you know, mega gigabyte RAM, you know, application. Anyway, I'm just thinking like if you, if you throw money at it, it might help a little bit to speed things along. But um, if you're patient and you're okay with using the free and open source side, I, I'm one of those individuals. Um, I'm not, I'm not uh, blazing any trails. Uh, I'm more than happy and be patient if it takes weeks for me to process something, that's okay. Um, it, it's, not a, it's not a barn burner. I, I'm, I'm adding just banter. I'm not really answering anything. <laughs> that's all I had. No, I think, I think that's all good input. Well, while you were kind of talking there, I was kind of thinking about this too. Like, like what's the utility of some of these things? Like, um, I remember Hadley gave a talk oh, a while ago, maybe a couple of years ago, this idea of like, you know, our user versus our developer. And so like a good chunk of people are more of kind of that our user and so like they may be kind of transitioning into a little bit more of that developer, but they don't have that like software engineering background. And I don't have that software engineering background. I'm not talking like I'm that kind of person or had that experience, but like, you know, for people who want to still build these tools, but don't necessarily have that experience to create their own containers and develop it. People have gone ahead and said, Hey, we're going to do a little bit of convenience for you and create these tools. You just submit it and we'll give you information. And so you know, I think it's kind of that idea of like the R user versus the R developer. And if you're on the way on the other end of like the R developer, these are tools that you should be using. The tools as in like CI, CD, GitHub Actions and all that, that those are tools that you probably should be relying on. But when you think of like the R community in mass, and again, I don't say I'm, I've done an entire survey of it, but you know, more people are probably in that kind of like R user territory and not in the R developer territory. And so some of these convenience tools were created to facilitate some of the workflow, I guess. That's my perception. It's a good talk. I should find that talk because it was it was kind of an interesting discussion. Um, but I don't know. I'm just kind of talking out loud now. So I wanted to add just one last comment. There was a, a debate I was having with our IT group, these, these individuals that provide you the environment but will not help you develop in the environment, right? So here's your AWS cloud, here's your, your you know, Kubernetes cluster. I'm gonna let you go and you build whatever you need to, but you know, if you have a question, just ask. So I, within the first hours, I automatically ran into some issues and I'm, I, I send them a response and I'm like, well, that's something you should talk to your team about. And I'm like, team? team, there's no team here. It's me. I, I, I'm the team. Like, like if I can't answer it myself, I need to have somebody else. Um, I, I, I want to convey there's a, there's a perceived thought that when you're working on package development or working in a, in an IT environment and doing something that maybe not anybody else has done, but just you're, you're limiting yourself to the community that you're reaching out to. And, uh, that, sometimes it's only one individual and, and the perceived notion that you're working with a, a large corporate enterprise grade team, <laughs> there is no team. So uh, Rex, I, I, I know you're, you're heavy into the package development. Brendan, you had mentioned that you were getting involved or, or, or writing a package at the moment. Um, I, I give you kudos. That's awesome. Uh, and, and I do realize that it is probably one individual. So I always offer, if there's anything that I can help with, I'm happy to to uh, nudge you one direction or the other. I definitely probably won't have the answer, but I'll, I'll get you close to it. So anyway. I think that's a good warning, like just a good warning too. Like, although we've kind of talked about some of these more advanced things, like, and for anybody who's watching later, like, don't let this stuff scare you away. You know, like, yeah, you can go down the rabbit hole of CI, CD pipelines and all of this stuff, but like, just start from the foundation, start with your expectation, move up to your testing suite, 
build a testing file and go from there. Like you don't have to dive just right into like building like a complete CI CD pipeline to get the benefits from this. And so like, although there's these tools available, you might not need these tools. And like Ryan was saying, if you're a team of one, me, I'm not going to go down the road of creating my own GitHub actions because I, you know, I was like, Oh, I could do this two hours. in, I was like, no, the, the ROI on this is just no, I, I can't do it right now. And it's not useful for me right now, but for certain teams, tidyverse team, they're tools that they need to do their job. So, but uh, cool. Anything else? Any, any other comments? I just want to kind of quick wrap up here. Uh, we're Brendan, you said you're going to cover for next week. I think, um, I think we've already kind of talked about the chapters that we were going to discuss. I, I know we, there was, uh, cause the book shifted, obviously. Um, I think, so some of the future chapters we've already covered. So I talked with Brendan already a little bit. Um, I think what we're going to do is we're going to cover the second half of chapter 10, which is namespace. And then chapter 11, which is dependencies, what your packages need. And so I think those two chapters were the original namespace chapter. Um, I'm going to do some shifting around. I'm going to see if I can do it tonight or tomorrow to kind of think about a path moving forward. But I think where we're at after those two chapters that Brendan covers next week is um, our command check, continuous integration, which we were just kind of talking about, releasing the CRAN, and then life cycle. And so... Um, I think we, because when you look at like other markdown files and websites that those chapters aren't done. So we really can't cover those. So we really, I think only have four other chapters left and, unless I'm missing anything. Um, but that's kind of our path forward that I'm thinking right now. So Brendan, are you cool with that? Yep, that works for me. All right, great. That's excellent. So if anybody's interested in covering like chapter 20, 21, 22, or 23, um, let me know. Uh, other than that, everybody have a good rest of your night. I can hang out here for a couple minutes. If not, we'll see everybody. All right. Thanks. Bye. Rex just left, but I was going to ask. So chapter 21, at least in the new content, the continuous integration, it's only two sections long and and really not full yet. So would it be advisable to go back and get to the previous one? The reason I asked this question, Rex had a lot of comments about the, the continuous integration, CI, CD process, GitHub actions, et cetera. Um, mm -hmm. I don't want to jump in the middle of it, but I would definitely like to challenge myself in this relation. I've never, I haven't used uh, CI, CD 100% yet. Um, I have theories or thoughts, plans that I would like to evoke in this comment or con, sorry, in this thought process, but I don't want to step on others if they uh, have a, a uh, use for the, the content, use for the purpose. Uh, I don't, I don't see anybody taking it. So um... is there there's no way to like make a note of it, or I can even post on, on uh, Slack with this topic, just to ask Rex um, if he would want to take it. If not, I'd be more than happy to volunteer for it. The, the whole thought of CICD or the whole thought of this GitHub actions, I haven't used GitHub very much. And there's a purpose behind that. It's the whole Microsoft acquired GitHub in 2019 and started to close everything. And I just kind of moved all of my material to GitLab. Um, so I, I, but, but get the previous GitHub used Travis CI and then Travis CI got into their, their uh, security vulnerability issue that they were generating. Um, I do have uh, Ansible. Uh, so uh, writing an Ansible script to generate or, or I don't know, produce content. Um, that's a Linux service. Um, there's also Puppet and Chef, I think is the other one. Uh, but these are all, CI CD pipeline type applications that do building, compiling, and automation to output something uh, on the back end. Yeah, I, I mean, yeah, I mean, 
Oh, go ahead. Sorry. Go ahead. Well, no, I was just going to throw one, one more comment in. The whole reason that I got into or got involved with Docker and, and Kubernetes and all this weird stuff that I've been dealing with as of late, um, our developers are software engineers at Cedar Rapids. They, uh, they require that you have a particular Linux kernel uh, to build or, or do the make file that generates or compiles out a particular software. And there's, I don't know, 20 or 30 different versions that you can, you can call on to build or compile from source. The process, I'm like, I don't know how you could even rely on such an old system. Like, how does that work? So what I discovered was the team had newer versions of Linux, you know, it was a 1904, 2004, uh, and that they were doing a CH root or an SCH root. And what that did was it modified your namespace to an older version of a kernel. So the application, when it was compiling, thinks that it's on an older version of, of operating system. Uh, but in truth, you're building it from a new system. And that's really what Docker containerization is, is, is this CH root, SCH root thought process. I'll send you some articles about it because it, it, it doesn't necessarily fit the bill for what Docker does, but it's close enough to it. Um, this thought process of, of changing namespace. And that's what CICD does. Uh, it, 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 mm -hmm. it calls on an environment, you push your code up to it, it pulls it from there and then compiles or does some action after it. Mm -hmm. And it's not, it's not relying on the host anyway. Huh. Yeah, I, I guess I didn't look at 21. I was just kind of like looking at what chapters were left here. So um, I mean, like if, if you want to do like our command check and continuous integration, I think the, well, or unless we do like our command check by itself, our command check is kind of like, I've read this chapter before. It's like a checklist. It's like, oh, is it? All right. here's like a checklist here, here's checklist here. So, I mean, it might be worth having a conversation with that. Um, and then like with continuous integration, like you said, there's not a whole lot here. Well, so maybe there's, there's opportunity to sprinkle some more into it. Of yeah. There's space like, to oh, add. Gosh. Yeah. Space to add some, some, uh, street credit into the, into the chapter. Um, mm -hmm. Frederica earlier today with advanced star finished her, uh, or sorry, she started the functions chapter, which is chapter six. She didn't completely finish the topic and didn't quite cover everything the way she wanted to. Um, she was asking for volunteers and nobody was jumping forward. She's the facilitator. So she went ahead and gave past cohorts uh, documents. Um, I offered to her for next week um, hmm. that I would tread some water into the uh, under the hood concepts of, of R in general using some of the, the body and the is it formula. It's not formula, formal, formals formals command, body command, environment command. Uh, and what that provides is like class commands where you can break into a function's underlying code and start mm -hmm. to manipulate these uh, variable or, or names that, that aren't exposed into the, the, uh, the actual namespace environment. Um, they're under the hood, S3, S4 concepts. Oh, so cool. I promised I would post some material for them too. Yeah, it would be it would be about two weeks because um, Brendan's going to cover the next two. Okay. And then um, probably about two weeks. Yeah, I mean, if you're interested, I'll, I'll open it up for anybody. Um, I'm going to change the schedule around and make sure because okay. I, I haven't updated the schedule in a while and need to, obviously, with the change in the book. Yeah. So um, I'll change that and then, you know, we can go do, from there. Do we have any post? Or is there a, a, a method of gaining the previous version of the document, like an older version of GitHub, uh, older version of, of, of the R packaging book? Uh, the only way that I could think would be, well, to, to get it from GitHub to look at the previous versions, but okay, that would be that's the only way that I would know, at least not on, that's the only way that I know. I, okay. I don't really know. I'll take a look there and see if there was more material with this particular chapter and see not what really it has get get like github actions like and the continuous integration stuff like that's like it's uh, for fairly, my it's fairly new well, it's fairly new the topic's actions. fairly new yeah GitHub so actions like, was released was it last year uh prior to that was travis ci um 
but yeah, the, the the whole thought process of CICD is is a fairly new topic. I would say it's it's within the last five to six years that it's been a, a service. And it's one of those things where it's like, you know, outside of the convenience functions that the use of this package provides. Okay. Like I just like you said, like if you're if you're a team of one, are you gonna create your own CI C D pipe? Maybe. I mean if you have the if you have the need and the sophistication to do it, but what well to to answer that statement. So one of the one of the tasks that I put on myself and I haven't finished it yet, um, but was to copy reveal JS as a framework, create a CI C D process so that when I upload my markdown file, it automatically goes through the reveal JS compiler. And then what gets output is an HTML file. And then you mm. can interact with it like a slideshow. Um, that's an example of, of doing it instead of running your own grunt commands and compiling from you know a, a, a JavaScript Node.js into, into a uh, HTML file. That's one process that you could use GitHub Actions with, or at least mm. there's instructions to do that. None of these are related to R. So I'm, I'm interested in researching the R concepts behind doing some of this stuff with the uh, package development, testing, being able to compile it into its actual package form, uh, binary form and, and on submission. Um, I'm in, I'm, one of the things that I'm very fascinated with is the outer fringes not CRAN necessarily, but all of the developers that don't put to CRAN. So you're reading some forum posts and, or, you know, some awesome tool. And it's like, oh yeah, you can install it from dev tools, GitHub, you know, some website. And then all of a sudden it pulls the code down, compiles, and now you've got your, your running environment with their package. It's a little bit on the fringes, but it's, it's, it's cool that you have that option. Um, that's really what I'd like to try and find if I could, if I could do uh, show somebody how to put all that together and, and, and test with it anyway. So. Yeah. And I mean, even too, like I said, look at that, look at that, look at that talk from Jim Hester. Okay. And even if you pull some snippets from that, because, you know, like, I thought this was a really interesting, you know, sure. perspective of it. And so, okay. But yeah, cool. Yeah. We can talk about, um, I'm going to jump off, but, okay, um, nice. let's, let's talk, let's, let's, if you're interested in doing that, um, let's I'll, I'll check in with you in a couple of weeks or next week and see if you're still good with it. Okay. If not, we can figure out a different path forward. So sounds like a plan. All, All right. right. Have a good rest of your night. Thanks Colin. We'll see you, see you later. Bye. Bye. -bye.